can you talk to us about fluids and its utility in sepsis? Absolutely. Okay. So sepsis, we've talked about um, blood volume and um, loss of blood in two ways. We've talked about it in loss through either externally vom um, vomiting or fluid, I should say, externally vomiting or through um, diarrhea. And we've talked about the blunt um, traumas where you're losing fluid within the the body itself, which is called intraperitoneal, like within the stomach. Now, what occurs when all of that happens is that we're having a drop in the volume. So we're having, and that's the term hypovolemia. So we're having a drop in the volume of um, fluid in the system. So we just described three ways. So with sepsis, hypovolemia can also occur, but this is occurring because of the body's inflammatory response. So the vessels dilate and the volume drops. So you're having a similar occurrence to those other two systems that we talked about, and that's why the fluid is needed. So when you're having um, sepsis, you're trying to, one reason why fluid is given ahead of time is you're trying to get the anti-inflammatory markers and so on. You're trying to reduce how um, the increase of these markers, you're trying to reduce that so that the body's um, system does not go into the shock, which is what we just said, hypovolemia. That's the medical term for hypovolemia is shock. So when you talk about septic shock, Think about the blood pressure has dropped. So that's a third way, a third avenue of having the blood pressure drop is through um, shock through sepsis. So that's why fluid is given either to prevent it or to do the same thing, which is resuscitate because it's the same pump system. Got it. So diagnostically, that takes me and I would have to look it up in the book to find out. So mm -hmm. sepsis with hypovolemia clinically is, is synonymous is sepsis with shock so that's it's, important yes, for us as shock. coders okay yes um, correct. because when we see i think and i don't know if they document it this way but sometimes we see a continual of a documentation and it might not be in the documentation section in the diagnosis section but it's in the record if we yes. as coders see hypovolemia and a confirmed sepsis we can mm -hmm. reasonably code septic shock correct Right. Okay. Yeah. That, that helps. Yeah. Because right. shock, shock is within its thing. You know, shock is is low blood pressure. So when we talked about um, trauma, that's the you know hemorrhagic shock. The blood pressure has dropped. Hemorrhaging, you're the the you're bleeding. When you get to hemorrhagic shock, the blood pressure has dropped. The um, dehydration you know, the heart rate goes up. When you get to shock, you've lost so much volume that the pressure is now low. So shock is the hypovolemia, which is the low, and it's seen through low pressure Got on it. the vital signs. Got it. Mm -hmm. So in critical care medicine, when do we talk, you talked about normal saline. When might we see uh, I worked for a group once and they said, you know, you could see it with additives, even when we have this coding tool and they somewhat terminated it, even though we see some of that in other mm -hmm. lines, um, IV with additives. Okay. Oh, okay. Additives. Yes. So the additives, you might see additives such as potassium, right? So yeah, IV fluids and potassium. So for example, a patient is coming in and we know that potassium and some of our electrolytes, there's a range that's need, that we need to adhere to. And if the body gets out of those range, then we know that we, there's some detrimental effect, right? And potassium is one of them. So when we, and I can even use the same example as the person who's vomited. So one way to lose potassium is through what we call the GI loss, gastrointestinal loss. So when you vomit excessively or you have excessive diarrhea, you lose potassium during that time. So your potassium, the normal range of potassium is really 3.5 to 4.5. When your potassium gets to 
it's like, yeah, wow, you've been really vomiting. You can see potassium going lower than like, you know, to 2.5 that, you know, those low numbers. If the patient is still vomiting and their numbers are low, you're going to give volume, which is IV fluid. And then you're going to give it with the additive, the potassium to replenish the potassium. So okay. that's one way that you'll see that. Okay. So I added as a really any of the, I guess, electrolytes or mineral, mineral, is that the right term clinically? Yeah. Electrolytes to, to, to in, that are added to the, the, um, to the, the fluid itself, like normal saline. And then another one too, you might see the infamous banana bag, for example, for um, the banana bag is usually normal saline. Um, and it's, um, Think it does have multivitamins, folic acid, um, thiamine, and a banana bag is usually used for those who are, um, if it's, it's used for alcoholic um, patients and to prevent them from having the detrimental effect from not just only alcohol withdrawal, from um, but the nutritional. Um, withdrawal that occurs when someone is an alcoholic and they're drinking excessively, but they're not eating. And then um, you will want to replace some of their electrolytes, but in doing so, you have to ensure that you give it in the right order in, in some respect, not, so you, they need the multivitamins, they need the folic acid, they need the, the, um, the, what else is in that mode? The, the fluids, multivitamin, folic acid, thiamine, and thiamine right. in order to prevent, especially um, in order to prevent them from having any neurological abnormalities. So, okay. and uh, yeah, so so that's an that's another additive. So you might see normal saline plus MVI. That's the multivitamin, thiamine, and folic acid, and that's another replacement. So for those patients, they can just get it like running normally at like a normal 75 cc's an hour if they're staying in the hospital overnight, or they might get it in boluses, um, especially as we mentioned, if they're having losses, right? They're an alcoholic and they're just vomiting, vomiting, vomiting excessively, then you would probably see them getting that within a bolus, but that's the additive to the normal saline. And that's a good point to pause because I think those might be the cases that we um, or something like that, because there were <laughs> always these frequent flyers in the ED to the yes. point. I feel like if an mm -hmm. ED physician knows your name, you've been there yes. too much, right? Yes, and it's like, I know this patient, this is a patient who comes in all the time, but mm -hmm. that's where I think clinic for us as coders, it's helpful because you those are the cases that are probably harder to see because until they go into that point, it's the lab values that are probably telling you what's happening with that patient. And mm -hmm. I've never seen the term banana bag, but you explaining what that might include with the thiamine, I think helps connect for us as coders. Oh, wait, we could have a big deal there, right? Yeah. Yeah. What kind of vitamins, thiamine, folic acid with the, with the saline. So, and it, the fact when you ask about additives, when we order it, it's usually the additives, the MVI, the folic, the thiamine. So that's what that prompted me to talk about additives. No, but that's great because that's where I think we might see the abnormal lab values and think, I don't know, right? Because, yeah. you know, and here's the thing, it's kind of like normal for who? Um, I think the worst <laughs> thing to do and probably the most dangerous thing I've ever done as a patient with the mm -hmm. healthcare experience I have is Google Labs. Like, oh, yes. you're dying. <laughs> that's what's wrong. You're dying if you Google yes, Labs. Yes, yes. Um, so for us, when we see all in, and in the medical records, they may be a different color or they'll say H is for highs. We may, mm -hmm. I, I think it's dangerous for us to ever look too critically into lab values because what we are like, oh my gosh, you as an AD doc, it's like, it's fine, right? Well, yeah, it's that's not fine. that yeah. high. But that's not the part that I'm worried about. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So, are there any things you look for, like in the alcoholic patient case in labs mm -hmm. that for you as an ED doc say, uh oh, this is going not the way I want it to go? Is that where you look where outside of the exam and maybe model skin or whatever um, outside of that? Are there some kind of critical lab values that you can feel 
comfortably would be that's absolutely stop the presses. Any ED physician is going to look at that and be concerned in the case of Correct. an alcoholic patient, for example, or even a dehydrated if you want to do that. Oh, sure. The sodium is another one that you that you're concerned on. So we talked about potassium, which is a GI, you know, gastrointestinal loss, which occurs, of course, in both and the sodium. So the sodium is another um, electrolyte that you're looking in your um, for once the sodium drops. The normal um, range will be up to like one. Like one. 30s or so is, is usually normal. 130s, 140s. Um, when you're dropping below 120s, especially if you're getting closer to 120, your concern. Um, so that uh, is that severe dehydration in a patient who's having um, gastrointestinal losses. Um, and the reason you become concerned is you have two points of reference is one is that you cannot replace sodium too quickly in the body because if you do you can cause um central pontine syndrome which essentially is you turn that person into a vegetable let's just say you this way wow. okay <laughs> so um so neurologically and um the other concern is that if the sodium drops too low then the patient can start to have seizures so okay. so you're replacing the um so that might be a case where you'll see the patients um the sodium is low and they're, they might be going to the either the intermediate icu or to the regular icu and then you might see them on um when we were trained sometimes we we're trained to give isotonic um i mean hypertonic pardon me saline so you might see the three percent normal saline at that time however um when you speak to sometimes our nephrologists they might say hey just give the gentle iv fluids and then we'll watch them but they need to be in like say the unit the icu so as a coder it might look like well why is this person going to the icu if they're only on normal saline at 75 cc's or even 20 cc's or 35 cc's an hour but it's the gentle hydration because of what we just mentioned you can't raise the sodium level too quickly, but they need to be closely monitored because they're they're at high risk for seizures and also for what we just mentioned, the central pontine syndrome. So those patients, they're that's the preemptive care where, you know, we talked about with the um the critical preemptive care. So we earlier in our discussion today, we've talked about giving the aggressive IV fluid as a part of critical care. But this one is given the IV fluid at a slower pace as a part of critical care, which at times we don't think about, right? Because we only think about aggressive. As Got care. it. And yeah. yeah, for us too, we're so, we're, we're not clinical. And it, like, I, I just, this was an aha moment for me, even the concentrations of saline. Cause you mm -hmm. know, you may not, you'll, know, Two percent or three percent or whatever percent we just see in ACL or sodium NAC, chloride. Yeah, point nine. <laughs> yeah, and it's like okay, yeah. It, they yeah. Just gave saline, but but understanding the way you just broke that down, it helps me understand all saline is not created equal, Correct. and the fact that I could potentially, or well, not me because not my lane, but a physician could potentially <laughs> give a patient fluids too generously. That also explains, I guess, why it's we see the monitoring sometimes in the ED over time and they're not just sent. They watch them for a while. You're trying to make sure that's given at a rate that it doesn't cause an even worse situation for a patient Correct. than what they started with. Wow. Correct. Yes. Amazing. Okay. All right. So <laughs> any any closing points you want to kind of give coders who are reporting in critical care as we try to bridge this gap between clinic speak and code speak? Well, I say that it's, uh, we were talking a little bit off camera too, as to some of the challenges that occurs between the, the physician's documentation and um, the interpretation with um, coders. We we're trained to document in order to communicate with each other if in and this is the test of time right so this is the we're we're still being trained in in the medicine 
and the language, albeit it's changing a little bit, but it's still a lot of its original Latin terms that is a quick way to effectively communicate with each other so that once another physician is looking at it, they understand. So it is understandable if at times you're not wondering if you're not getting like what are these people talking about because the communicative portion it's not set out like you know saying every single thing because we have small words that um expresses to each other as physician well oh well if i see that then this is what's going on so don't beat yourself up <laughs> if you have to ask you know, it's best to ask to to get an understanding and an answer because the way that we were trained to document us as physicians, we were trained to document to to talk to each other. And so if you're finding yourself being frustrated, especially if you're new at coding and you're new to this, understand that, you know, it'll take time and it's okay to ask. I think that that's the biggest thing. It's okay to ask. This is not, this is literally learning a new language. And when we went into medicine, we learned this language and we're speaking to each other in this language. You're coming in and you're sitting down trying to understand a language that you weren't immediately taught. So don't get frustrated. Just try to, um, you know, get the translation. So ask someone to translate it for you. <laughs> I appreciate that. And and thank you. And the final tip for, for docs and coders is to realize mm -hmm. medicine is older than the money management and administrative matters to matters of medicine, right? Absolutely. So as that's been updated and there's more scrutiny and it's now reimbursement for services and claims and compliance, uh, coders mm -hmm. often don't feel comfortable guessing or interpreting. I, I stay in a coder's lane and I often share with us, it is not our job, nor is it really within the scope of our work, should we try to interpret data yes that mm -hmm. lab value is x so i'm going to give the patient a condition no they just have an abnormal lab value we can't give them a, the doc can but we can't so um, anything that we can do to understand that if a coder comes back and says well i don't understand and that doesn't say it might be one of those things where i might feel comfortable coding this based on what i believe and how i'm interpreting that but to do that, I have to interpret documentation in a clinical manner, which is outside of my scope as a person. So us coming back and saying, Doc, can you just document that? I know that's pretty sure what it means, like the chemical pregnancy thing we talked about. I'm, pr I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure that's what you meant, but you also said something else. And when you say that and I translate that in the book, it's coding to something that you didn't mean. So coding Correct. just throws an additional curveball with it. So thank you. Uh -huh. I'm so I love this session with Dr. Tamara Beckford. Um, in it, we learned about saline and the dosing of saline. Real aha moment, as you might notice uh, during the video that I experienced, was totally changing my view about how I looked at critical care saline and sepsis. It was very common for us to see saline. Um, sometimes we would even say antibiotics. And what sometimes gave me pause from a thought process was, why are all of these antibiotics being done when we kind of don't know what the pathogen is yet? Um, when antibiotics are given, antibiotics help bacterial infections. They don't do a whole lot for viral infections or fungal infections or uh, the many other, I guess, organisms that could potentially be a cause for sepsis. So this actually changed my view on sepsis because the take home notes that I got from that was we're treating what sepsis does as opposed to the organism itself at that point. So because of how the circulatory system or blood vessels are responding in res uh, as a result of that insult, that is what they're treating by the administration of those fluids. So real aha moment there. Also learning more about the sodium ranges. Again, as a, as a, con a coding professional, that's not a clinical person, not with a nursing background or anything like that. You know, I, I could say I probably looked at all saline alike. It's saline. I saw it on the order. Didn't really pay a lot of attention to the formulation of saline. Sometimes the volume of saline, which we talked about a little bit earlier in part one. 
uh, or part two for dehydration, um, the volume of saline may be significant, but the timing of it was really the aha moment here and the importance of the provider dosing. It really let some bells go off for me because oftentimes we would see ED records where maybe the patient was placed on observation in the emergency department, um, or they were uh, critical care, but we saw kind of a, a longer time period than what we would typically care. So her statement about, you know, consulting with nephrology and uh, being careful about how they dose that patient from a saline perspective, you think, okay, it's sodium, what's the big deal? You know, in, in the sense that letting the saline, this uh, sodium level go too lower could cause a seizure for the patient and giving it too aggressively um, or too generously over a period of time from a close period of time standpoint could lead to that central pontine syndrome. Feel free to research that. Diagnostic tips on this as we talk about sepsis um, and the use of fluids. Uh, she helped us understand how hypovolemia clinically in the physician's world is hypovolemia is what shock is. The low blood volume is shock. The system isn't working the way it should. So there's a couple of diagnostic options based on what your records are supporting. Now, again, anything with you report, you'd want to, you know, make sure you feel comfortable. But the, the vision behind this session and any of my dialogue with the doc sections is really to give you an opportunity if you're a coder who does not have the benefit of dialoguing with a provider to find out what that means clinically. You'll notice I'll ask so when it comes to values, what, what's kind of the consensus with regard to this? Because even how some physicians practice isn't always, the records aren't always seen the same or the patients aren't treated exactly the same. So this just really helps us with coders. So if you do have a sepsis with shock or sepsis with uh, hypovolemia being synonymous with that, that's going to lead you diagnostically to R65.21. It's important to note that R65.21 is your sepsis, uh, severe sepsis with septic shock, severe meaning there's an acute organ dysfunction as a result of the sepsis, and you'd have to first pick up the causal organism to um, report the sepsis diagnosis, right? So that's going to cover the sepsis. It's going to cover the shock. You'd need the causality or the pathogen or organism. If that's not specified, your guidelines do point out sepsis NOS is A41.9, which basically just means all I have is sepsis. I don't have an organism. Um, if again, sometimes timing and records with everything the providers do, we're not always able to, uh, the providers aren't always able to save that patient. So if you just see your hypovolemia, because maybe we've got a lot of volume loss because of vomiting and uh, dehydration or some of those things that she talked about in the alcoholic patient who might come into the ED need additives because in addition to drinking so much, they're also not eating enough or eating at all. So you might just have a hypovolemia and have to paint the picture in the form of symptoms, the hypovolemia, the excessive vomiting, etc. cetera. Um, that in that case, even the alcohol abuse might be causality related to that as far as um, something reportable in the concept of the encounter as the cause of the visit, um, though not the immediate cause for critical care or why they came in. So that will be a sequencing thing. But hypovolemia E86.1, if the vo hypovolemia or low blood volume is such that the patient has gone into shock, but we don't have a sepsis diagnosis yet, you can look to hypovolemic shock R57.1. You'll note when you back up to the category with the um, Following the coding guidelines, you should. That is, use your index, use your subterms, go to your tabular, go look to your code, look around your code. That's parentheticals. Back up to the category and sometimes to the section based on the section that you're in, you'll notice that hypovolemia E86.1 and hypovolemic shock, that is, we've gotten so low that the system is in shock without that corresponding diagnosis of sepsis kind of being confirmed, is going to lead you to R57.1. And at E86.1, they're also going to remind you that excludes two. So that's telling you that E86.1 does not include 
include or was not meant to include the condition for hypovolemic shock. So with R57.1, you could pick up both the fact that the patient was hypovolemic and it led to shock. Uh, again, that's disassociating with sepsis. So I found this session to be really, really exciting. Um, I hadn't heard of the term banana bag, but again, learning the sodium ranges, those additives and what they do. And now I understand why a little bit better, why we might see MVI is how they abbreviated the multivitamins in the record really is great for us to um, bridge that gap between clinic speak and code speak, which is my vision. So I am your friend, Doris the Coder, once again, signing out with another video. I was so excited for this session. Uh, immensely grateful to Dr. Tamara Beckford with UR Caring Dachshund, uh, UR Caring Society, and hopefully we'll have more on the horizon. But until the next video, I will see you then. I'm signing out.